uh, Griselda Grizz uh, is a senior project manager at Tetra Tech and has uh, supported and led all phases of odor control projects for over 15 years from sampling and monitoring studies to large scale odor control systems, including wet scrubbers, bio scrubbers, and carbon scrubbers. Uh, she was the odor control specialist uh, for major con uh, odor control facilities, along with conveyance systems, including the Brightwater Conveyance System, uh, City of Edgewood, and City of Mercer Island. Uh, Grizz is currently leading the odor con control design for the North Mercer Anatai sewer upgrade. Adam Jenkins is an associate principal with the Greenbush Group Incorporated. Uh, providing acoustical consulting services for a wide range of projects such as environmental noise monitoring, mitigation and measurement for water and wastewater facilities. Adam has worked closely with mechanical engineers to develop noise and vibration control approaches for HVAC equipment in the industry and utilities, uh, odor control systems for wastewater systems and residential and commercial spaces. He utilizes reality grounded 3D computer modeling to evaluate complex acoustical environments, uh, providing efficient and optimized mitigation approaches for challenging environmental noise issues. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to uh, Grizz and Adam. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, excited to be here and excited to present today. Uh, Adam and I have had the opportunity to work together on several odor control projects that have required the need to address both odors and noise. Uh, these projects consist of providing new odor control systems that are implemented with noise generating mechanical equipment. Uh, typically these odor control facilities are located adjacent to residential areas or public areas with nearby receptors where both the presence of odors and the generation of noise can create issues. Uh, in addition, these facilities have to meet the local noise code at the property line, thus the point of compliance. Uh, so today our presentation is addressing odor nuisance without creating a noise nuisance. Uh, we're going to discuss approaches to ensure that the design of the odor control facility not only addresses the odor issues, uh, but does not create noise issues. So I will begin with an overview of odor control technologies and identify typical noise generating equipment associated with these systems. Uh, Adam's going to discuss approaches for establishing existing noise level conditions, uh, establishing the project noise reduction goals, and then how to perform an acoustical analysis to predict future sound emissions associated with the new equipment and incorporate mitigation measures in the contract documents, and then also execute uh, performance and ensure performance requirements are met uh, in the construction phase. Uh, we're going to close with a project example that brings all of this together and shows the process from uh, planning, design, and construction. Uh, this uh, slide provides an overview of the process. Uh, for these projects, the goal is to implement the appropriate odor control system. Initially, this is an odor control project, so we want to ensure that the first step is to uh, address the odor constituents and the odor issue at hand. But we also want to ensure that noise nuisance is not created. So upon selecting the appropriate odor control system, the noise control goals need to be established. Um, are we addressing noise because it's a community hot button, or are there strict noise regulations that need to be met? So identifying what the noise control goals and design criteria early on are important. Uh, it's important to characterize, characterize the existing noise conditions and then identify the potential noise from the mechanical equipment associated with the odor control system and uh, to evaluate the sound emission levels uh, in order to determine really what extent of mitigation is required in the design. Hey Grizz, uh, last, it, hey Grizz, it looks like you're not in presentation mode. Do you want to flip over? Sure. No, 
quite sure how I would do that. People can see your screen. It's it's showing as presentation mode on my computer. Apologize. That's probably not helping either. Is that any better? Nope. Cl click on the uh, screen thing down at the bottom. Down here. <laughs> Can't see what you're doing, so. Screen. I will click back into presentation mode. I apologize. That presentation a better. Uh, we're still seeing the same thing, but I guess uh, at this point, let's just yeah, we that works fine. On. Yep. We, yeah, we can see, it. can see that. That works. Okay, perfect. I apologize. It's presentation mode on my screen here. So, um, so um, lastly, I, I was saying uh, after we've gone through this process, uh, the important part is to uh, identify what the noise mitigation is required and incorporate it into the contract documents and ensure that the noise goals are met. So there are three main types of odor control systems that we typically work with. Uh, many of you are aware of carbon scrubbers, wet scrubbers, and biological scrubbers. Uh, these are vapor phase odor control systems that treat the odor constituents from the odor source. Uh, a common element to these systems is the exhaust fan, which can either push or pull the airflow through these odor control systems. Uh, carbon scrubber systems are typically implemented to address lower uh, H2S concentrations, and the noise generating equipment is typically the exhaust fan, which has a higher pressure loss associated with either pulling or pushing the airflows through the carbon media uh, located inside the vessel. As you can see here on the upper right hand um, corner or left hand corner. Uh, wet scrubber shown on the right hand side uh, addresses high odor constituent concentrations and include the use of chemicals such as sodium hypochlorite and caustic and that's introduced into the wet scrubber typically through recirculation pumps. Uh, both the exhaust fan and the recirculation pumps are typically the noise generating equipment uh, from the wet scrubbers uh, that usually need to be evaluated in the design. Uh, biofilters uh, include the exhaust fans that typically have a higher pressure loss and can lead to higher noise emissions uh, that need to be addressed. So some design considerations uh, to um, keep in mind during the design phase after you've identified your odor control system, you've identified your noise emission equipment is uh, designing the ductwork within the appropriate velocity. You wanna make sure you avoid high pitched whistling noises associated with higher velocities uh, and then also uh, unnecessary higher friction losses uh, that impact your fan selection. Uh, you wanna avoid fans operating at a high speed, which not only requires more operating power, but produces more noise than a larger fan at a lower speed. Uh, obviously, siding, considering to locate the fan or any of your noise generating equipment upstream of the odor control system to push air flows through the media. And the media itself, especially for carbon scrubber systems, can provide further sound attenuation uh, before your air flows discharge through the stack. Uh, and you wanna site the noise generating equipment away from the point of compliance uh, and your receptors. Good morning, everybody. This is um, Adam Jenkins. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to get with you all today. And uh, as Grid said, that we have, we've had the opportunity to work uh, together on several projects and appreciate the opportunity to, to share some of that uh, experience with, with you all. Uh, so the, the first step in the in a, in a noise control process is to dis 
to establish your design criteria. So similar process for, for air quality or for order control, we're, we're trying to establish the target that we're trying to hit um, with respect to noise. And um, often compliance with whatever local noise ordinances may apply is, is sufficient, and that's usually where we start. And that's often typical to satisfy SEPA and to minimize most noise complaints. However, there's some situations where the owner may want to consider a more stringent design criteria. Uh, this may include scenarios where the existing ambient conditions of the site are relatively low, or you have some um, stakeholders or neighbors that we may consider, quote, passionate, end quote, about noise. You know, these are folks that are um, very involved in the process, uh, maybe have resisted the project's development, um, and it's uh, it's important to you know communicate to them that, that noise is an important resource that's being considered. Um, in in terms of going above and beyond uh, code requirements for more stringent criteria, something that's often done is to minimize increase to existing conditions. This goes back to an EPA Region 10 document uh, from the early 70s that was never codified, but those guidelines have really stuck, and that. Um, suggest to try to increase, limit increases to existing conditions by not more than five decibels. Um, again, not required by law, not required by SEPA, but something that's all, often considered when um, installing odor control systems in quiet um, rural or um, um, suburban environments. And I've included a flow chart here to kind of walk you through that process. Um, whether you're whether the owner is looking to minimize a community impact, in which case you want to go out and document conditions and see how noisy it is there already and walk through that process or simply stick with with code compliance. Okay, Chris, next. Okay, let's talk a little bit about terminology. Uh, decibels, we're all fairly familiar with, with the concept of decibels, I suspect. Um, for the human ear, it takes about a three decibel change to be perceptive. A 10 decibel change uh, increase would be a double, doubling of loudness. A 10 decibel decrease is a halving of loudness. So when we start getting into the you know, 0.1 decibels and 0.5 decibels, we're really splitting hairs. It takes you know, integer increases or decreases of, of decibel levels to really make a difference. Uh, the most common uh, metrics that we're using when we're talking about noise would be LEQ which is um, basically described as the average sound level. It's actually the equivalent energy sound level of the energy that's integrated over a specific period, most commonly an hour, but we can casually call it the average sound level. Uh, and L sub N, these are statistical sound levels, most often used in very rigorous codes. For example, the state of Oregon, which we'll get into a little bit later. These look at the uh, cumulative distribution function of um, sound levels over time. So your loudest 1%, your quietest 99%, and those help us characterize uh, existing sites. Uh, transmission loss, insertion loss, absorption coefficients, these are all um, uh, descriptions of specific products you might specify for a project and contract documents. And then we have the, the big one is the sound power versus sound pressure. So the, my favorite analogy here is the sound power is how many decibels your your light bulb is, how many watts your light bulb is, but the, the decibels of sound pressure is how bright it is in the room. You could have a 40 watt watt light bulb that results in very minimal um, brightness in a room in terms of foot candles if the room's totally black or if the walls are painted white. So the sound pressure is what we hear and the sound power is what the equipment is actually generating, which is what we want to specify. Okay, Chris. So um, identifying noise code limits and points of compliance depends on your depends on your jurisdiction. Most often in the state of Washington, the city of Seattle, King County, uh, most areas throughout Washington State, it's based on at the property line. So it's the boundary of transition of ownership between two real property parcels. And this is often either based on land use zoning or land use. The state code um, defaults to land use. So if you have an area where people are sleeping, it's considered a residential district. However, most municipalities have um, included areas in their zoning code that have assigned these use categories to zoning designations. So most often it actually impl is implemented based on the land use zoning. Uh, Oregon State is one of the more interesting ones, and I say that in a positive way. Uh, instead of um, establishing point of compliance at the property line, it actually looks 25, point, 25 feet away from the nearest noise sensitive building. So where's the house on the property? So if you have a 10 acre rural parcel, uh, you're not looking at it at the property line right next to the, the steel mill. You know, you're, you're looking at it 25 feet from the building uh, where people are sleeping. And um, oh, I, there are some areas that don't have quantified noise limits, Idaho, state of Idaho being one of them. Um, where there, there is no quantified sound level limit for the state. 
Okay. Next, Grizz. So how do we uh, characterize existing noise conditions? You know, this would be going out and measuring existing conditions. We recommend that you do that for at least three days. You do it continuously for 24 hours, try to get a weekday, try to get a weekend. It's also good to try and capture existing equipment. Well, sometimes that's that's not a benefit if you've got a site that's that you're concerned about it being um, already non-compliant with, with code conditions. But um, up to the owner on whether or not you want to go out and assess that existing condition, but it's important to note that whatever equipment you do add is going to add to the noise footprint. So in terms of considering your design criteria, you want to make sure that you at least have a good understanding of, of what's out there already. Okay. So uh, for odor control systems, what are we really looking at here? Well, the dominant noise source is the blower, right? This is typically an FRP blower that's um, I, that's either pulling sound through some sort of filtration bed or push sounding, pushing sound through some sort of filtration bed. And Drew will talk more about the odor control technologies, but typically the big one's the blower. You also could have recirculation pumps in the condition of, you know, if you're wet scrubbers or bio scrubbers, and those can also be a, a big source of noise, which we'll get into in our example. And of course, with, with water wastewater facilities, you also have a lot of other sources, whether they're generator sets, uh, heat pumps, um, transformers, process mechanical, things like that, that that need to be considered also. But odor control is, is typically the big one, especially in, in rural environments. And when you're starting out uh, with the analysis, you always want to start with the sound power levels from the manufacturer, whether it's Hartzell or as airs into wherever the manufacturer information is coming from, almost always will have sound power levels. You might have to ask a few times, you might have to ask a different person, but that sound data is typically available and is, is the most helpful. Okay, Chris. Okay, so what do we do when we have this information? Well, typically we'll take these sound power levels and put them into a 3D computer model. We'll take CAD files from from the drafting team and put them into a, a modeling software. There's a lot of software packages available. I like, I, well, I use CADNA, I'm not adv advocating for that. We're saying anyone should go purchase it, but it's simply the one, the one that I've used over my uh, career. And it's based on International Standard, International Organization of Standardization, ISO, um, part 96, or 96 through 13 part two, which is a international standard for predicting sound propagation outdoors. So it's based in standard methodology. And uh, in this software, you can describe very specific noise sources and um, determine sound levels at property lines or 25 feet from the neighboring building. You can create very, you know, colorful pictures, which we'll, we'll look at later, that show the sound contours. You know, but it, used with caution. I have a, a colleague who's got a very interesting expression that if it looks that good, it must be right. <laughs> Right. So there's a tendency to generate these really great looking figures, but it's easy to get bad output, right? Garbage in, garbage out. And the, the modeling process is very complicated. So, you know, use with use with caution, but with someone that has has experience and understands what, what's going into the input um, parameters, these tools are, are really helpful for predicting sound levels. Okay. Okay, so the mitigation process is fairly straightforward. Once you have the modeling modeling done, you're identifying the dominant sources. Where is most of the sound coming from? Are we exceeding at the property line or a point of compliance? Determining which source sources are the ones that dominate that exceedance and really drive it, you know, the critical noise sources. And then how are we gonna attenuate them? For odor control, often we're looking at silencers, FRP type silencers or stainless silencers. If the blower itself is outdoors and not vaulted or in a building, are we putting a sound enclosure around the blower? Um, if we have FRP ductwork that noise really likes to break out of, are we wrapping that ductwork with additional mass? Do we need to look at potential modifications to the OCU system or relocate the, the fan to try to minimize the, the noise footprint? And just repeat this process until, until you've satisfied your um, design criteria. And uh, Grizz will go into how we actually take these mitigation strategies and implement them into uh, construction documents. Thank you, Adam. Uh, so after identifying the mitigation approaches, uh, like Adam was talking about, the next step is to incorporate these into the contract documents. Uh, so this includes the uh, noise performance requirements that should be identified in the contract documents. Uh, what are the noise co code levels that we're trying to achieve? Uh, for each equipment that we've identified as noise generating equipment, we want to provide the maximum sound power levels allowed. Uh, this will ensure that the equipment selected 
will be within the sound power levels that were evaluated in the noise analysis. Uh, for silencers and sound traps that were identified as part of the mitigation, uh, we want to make sure that we include the sound absorption and transmission loss minimum requirements uh, identified in the analysis. And uh, another thing is we want to consider unit responsibility. Uh, consider if the odor control system supplier not only provides the odor control equipment, but is also responsible for meeting the noise performance requirements uh, and the noise uh, mitigation equipment, such as the sound trap, uh, in order to uh, provide sole responsibility to one uh, supplier and ensure that there's coordination among these multiple suppliers. In the submittal requirements, the contractor should also be required to provide an acoustical performance data test report that will confirm that the system installed meets the project uh, requirements as well as the noise code level requirements. Uh, and you want to include uh, specific requirements of that plan and make sure that it meets uh, testing standards. That's very important. Uh, and then for testing in the contract documents, uh, owner can consider the option of either testing the uh, system that not, not only includes the equipment uh, with the noise generating emissions like the fan, but also the equipment plus the sound trap and test it at the factory to ensure that that system package uh, will meet the required noise goals prior to shipping and installing at the Site. Of course, that does have an added cost to the project, needs to be weighed with the field testing requirements to ensure that the noise code levels are met. So those are options that you want to consider uh, when developing your contract requirements. So now we want to review a case study as an example of a project where Adam and I worked together to identify the odor control system appropriate to meet the odor control issues for that project, identify the noise generating equipment, analyze the pre-existing conditions, uh, and develop a noise model to predict future noise emissions. Uh, and then implement, uh, identify and implement mitigation measures to ensure that at the end we met the project goals for not only odor but also for noise. So in 2010, the city of Bainbridge Island wastewater treatment plant was upgraded. Uh, the treatment plant is located in a very constrained site surrounded by uh, residents located less than 40 feet away thus necessitating a high degree of noise, odor, and architectural mitigation. Uh, improvements were made to the headworks and the aeration basins and the clarifiers, as you can see there in the presentation. Uh, also included improving the biosolids handling system uh, located in a new building with a drive-through garage for uh, loading sludge trucks. Uh, blowers were provided for the aeration basin and as well as the sludge storage tank uh, and a new standby generator were located in a new blower building with uh, acoustical sound traps provided for noise mitigation. So the first step uh, was to identify what are the primary odor sources uh, and what can create the odors in this plant. Obviously, the headworks typical odor uh, generating area with your screening systems and your grit washer, typical H2S concentrations are of concern at a headworks building. Uh, the solids building, uh, the solids process was uh, to uh, implement a class A uh, solids process. So we were now dealing with not only H2S uh, constituents, but also ammonia. Uh, and the solid storage tanks as well were another uh, identified odor source. So through uh, evaluation, your typical evaluation of your selecting the right odor control system, we identified what were the odors of concern, what were the appropriate technologies that could handle these odor constituents and treat them, uh, and we also did a comparison of operation and maintenance costs just to ensure that the final selection of the appropriate odor control technology was also the best present worth cost uh, um, option. 
Uh, we worked with O&M staff uh, to ensure that they understood each of the technologies and collabor collaboratively we uh, recommended a wet scrubber uh, as the appropriate technology not only to address the H2S odors associated with the headworks but also the ammonia odors associated with the Class A solid handling system. So the first step, knowing that we had a wet scrubber, was to identify the equipment uh, of concern that would generate noise. So as we previously uh, identified, not only was this the exhaust fan, but also the uh, recirculation fans uh, for the odor control system. Um, we also wanted to uh, identify what is the goal for the plant? What are we trying to achieve with you know, receptors less than 40 feet away? Uh, what was and this was uh, dictated by the noise code level 55 decibels at the property line during daytime and 45 decibels at the property at nighttime so we had to ensure that not only were we meeting the noise requirements but the community was also a strong driver uh, to making sure we reduce noise as part of this project uh, in addition to the equipment associated with the odor control, we also had to consider other primary noises coming from the existing plant. Uh, this included a grit washer and cyclone um, HVAC system, RAS pumps, effluent pumps. So we wanted to characterize what other equipment is creating noise that would then feed into the noise model. Uh, looked at the new odor control equipment that would be also um, you know, generating noise as well as the blowers. So we identified what were proposed equipment would be impacting uh, the noise study. Okay, so I'm going to walk you through the the major noise sources that we evaluated in the project, and then focus a little bit more on the odor control. So this is an example of the the noise sources that were the focus of the the noise modeling, which you can see on the on the next slide, next slide teaser to the right. Uh, and these are sound power levels that were obtained from uh, the manufacturer. So as you look at noise on projects, and I strongly recommend that you, you, you exercise that diligence to actually obtain these sound power levels, power being the keyword from the, from the manufacturers to conduct this analysis. And these sound power levels were, were, um, are, are described in terms of octave band sound power levels. So this is how much sound power is radiating from these various pieces of equipment in each octave band, so across this larger frequency spectrum. And then on the very right, we have that A-weighted sound power level, the, the DBA nomenclature that a lot of us are, are familiar with. So the generator, we've got uh, you know the engine exhaust that's coming from the motor, the radiated sound from the from the from the radiator itself, and the big one on this on this um, presentation is that odor control fan uh, new, uh, fan discharge. So publicly funded project. We're typically not sole sourcing these things. So this is our basis of design, the New York blower, and uh, with the particular um, operating point that was selected by um, the design engineers for that. And then uh, this is the amount discharged from the from the from the fan itself. And then we're also looking at radiated sound. If you see just to the left of that 45 dBA box, we have a little plus sign inside that gray circle and that's the the stack from the from the odor control system so this is where the sound is 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 discharging from the stack and then these various colored contour lines these are the equivalent sound level contours similar to an elevation map for dig, a digital terrain model and we see that our design criteria was was 45 dba which is that dark green line between the yellow and the lighter green and we see that that dark green line pretty much spans the, the entire property. And we're trying to make sure that that dark green line is within the adjacent, adjacent receiving properties. You can also see a, a several other noise sources on the screen um, that were modeled, but you know, our specific focus today is the, is the odor control system. Okay, Chris, next. So what kind of um, mitigation measures did we end up using on this project? Well, we had um, acoustical enclosures around the odor control system. Um, there were two components. Uh, there was one blower provided by one manufacturer, and then there was the actual um, odor control system was provided by another manufacturer that included recirculation pumps. And the recirculation pumps inside the, the, field, the odor control system were, were ended up being a, a very dominant noise source. Uh, other noise sources on... Um, the, the site included air compressor and also obviously the generator room and, and blowers for, for process mechanical. Those are 
those are another um, you know big element to the noise source footprint of the project okay Chris okay so uh, so what do we end up doing we needed to specify these noise control um, products for for the project to make sure that we met our design criteria. So we specified um, a sound enclosure um, for the, the blower and for the wet scrubber. Um, and the way that we specified that in the con contract documents was a maximum sound level of 60 dBA at 10 feet. Again, this is a maximum sound pressure level of 60 decibels A weighted dBA at a distance of 10 feet. And we required, a, there was a contractual requirement in the construction documents for there to be a factory test conducted at 10 feet prior to shipment of the of the system to ensure that the criteria was met and that they had to be running under full capacity and full load and uh, actually simulating how it would operate on site. Um, this information was required to be submitted to the design engineer for review and approval. Um, so the, the, this did happen. Um, they, they did do the testing and they submitted the information. Um, but one of the lessons learned we'll get in we'll get into a little bit later is is that, um, that the submittal acceptance process and how you handle uh, a situation where maybe they're not meeting the requirements of the test uh, before they before they ship the unit. Okay, Chris, good. Next slide, please. So here are a couple photos of the um, enclosure that was installed by the contractor. On the top right, the stainless steel enclosure that's around the blower, and you have a um, a mushroom type uh, exhaust fan on the the lid of that blower to to get the heat buildup out of that enclosure. And once you enclose a piece of mechanical equipment that's doing work and generating um, energy, you know, you've, or, or dissipating energy, you've got that heat buildup you need to take care of. Uh, and then beyond that stainless steel enclosure, you see the white um, FRP style uh, scrubber and that the recirculation pumps are what were located inside that scrubber unit. And then the bottom picture on the left, that little red circle shows where in the plant um, this odor control unit was actually actually placed within the footprint. Okay, Chris. Okay, so what were some what were some lessons learned? Uh, the factory testing, I still strongly recommend that you um, that you consider that if you're specifying uh, a noise control product um, as sensitive as is odor control system enclosure. Um, but there needs to be, you know, real. Um, you know, clarification in the language or enforcement in the spec, a variety of different um, approaches to ensure that that product isn't shipped to the site or isn't accepted on site until that submittal process is actually approved. Uh, it's easy to put in test requirements in the specs, but once the submittal comes through, they might ship the product. Um, it might be on a truck uh, to the site before that submittal approved and it shows up, the general takes possession of it, doesn't reject it, and then how do you, how do you handle that from that point? On. So factory testing is recommended and field testing, it, it's tempting on the surface in terms of um, actually having site conditions, but we all know once something's delivered to a site and installed, you know, it becomes a challenge. It's a dollars game uh, with, with the contractor, both general and sub, to um, figure out what they're going to do. And as Grizz mentioned before, there's an issue of unit responsibility where the sound enclosure manufacturer is pointing at the, the the blower manufacturer and saying, well, your fan's too loud. And the blower manufacturer is looking at the sound enclosure vendor and saying, well, you didn't build your sound enclosure well enough. So it's really important to get it clear in the specifications, as Chris mentioned earlier, who has ultimate unit responsibility for that entire noise um, noise source. Okay, and I think uh, now we will uh, open it up to, to any questions that you may have on, uh, on the things we talked about. All right, thank you very much, Chris and Adam. So this is Miao Miao. I can help with any questions. So everyone, if you have any questions, you can just type type it in the sidebar on the Go meeting uh, and uh, just send it to us directly. Okay, it looks like we got one. Um, the question is, in regard to the acoustical analysis map, what existing site information do you input to generate the contours? For example, do you need building layout and height, trees, etc., or are those contours simply 
a result of the noise source and the direction is expected to project sound? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, this is Adam. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So the typical things that we'll will include in the the noise model are building footprints. So uh, if it's a new project for on a new site using the CAD drawings that um, are available, you know, through the design process and locating those buildings on site, inputting the heights so that those the screening or shielding of those buildings is accounted for in the model. We'll also include um, DTM information, digital terrain model, so the elevation contours of the site. Often these projects are located in, you know, in very you know, interesting areas in terms of, of, um, of existing contours, so we'll account for that. Um, we don't often account for vegetation surrounding the site. Uh, we, the model certainly can, and the ISO standard accounts for that. Um, it has an object that you can put in the model for that. We usually um, do not do that. Another um, critical piece of modeling information is the site itself. Is it a grass site? Is it a green site? Is it a concrete site? Making sure that um, the model itself accounts for the, the reflections off, off the ground surface. So those are the main, main ones, existing buildings or buildings that are going to be constructed as a part of the project, uh, the ground absorption, and um, just making sure that we have all those uh, other objects on site, whether they're clarifier, clarifier tanks or digester tanks, things like that, that all those reflections are accounted for. Right. The second question is, um, if a project site is in the industrial area, do you still care about the noise control? Uh, yeah, that, so this is Adam, I'll take a stab, and then Grizz, if you want to fill in, um, welcome. Um, so there, if, if a existing, if a municipality has a noise ordinance, 99% of the time it also applies to industrial areas. So there may not be neighbors near the property that are worried about the project, um, but in terms of due diligence, it's you know I think it's always important to make sure that that box is checked. Um, it, the the risk is low. It's not a high risk situation in terms of ending up with a situation of noncompliance, but you know it's it, I, there there still are likely laws that apply to your noise footprint on that site. Yeah, I agree. I think the uh, only other concern is depending on other nearby industrial businesses being able to really identify uh, and evaluate the impact of the equipment that we're installing specific to maybe surrounding noise uh, that's in the area can sometimes be a challenge. Okay, I think uh, we're at about uh, the point where we need to move on. Uh, thanks, everybody. If there are additional questions, we will uh, follow up with them uh, and get responses out later on. So with that, uh, I would like to introduce our uh, second presenter. Uh, that is Jeff, uh, Jeff Zoller. Uh, Jeff has been a, a process engineer working uh, in the research, design, and construction of both water and wastewater treatment facilities for 14 years. He served as a chair of the PNCWA uh, Odor and Air Quality Committee since 2015 and has comp completed numerous odor control field studies and facility designs. His focuses are in chemical feed systems, primary clarification, odor control, pumping systems, and hydraulics. Uh, digester gas handling, secondary treatment, disinfection, and corrosion control. He holds a BS in chemical engineering from Montana State University and MSc from the Environmental Engineering Department of the University of Washington and is a registered chemical engineer in the state of Washington. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Thanks, Dick. Um... So for, for my presentation today, we're going to focus on what's traditionally looked at um, as a uh, soft side to the engineering that uh, uh, we all like to do when it comes to the, the odor control systems. Uh, in particular, this is going to be the aesthetics aspect, um, how we integrate odor control facilities within new plants, uh, existing plants, um, distribution systems where you have a visual mitigation component to it that becomes very difficult and can often drive a design. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is take you through uh, functionally why this is a critical topic, uh, what the general trends that drive this being something that we that we need to discuss as far as a, as a design issue, 
what those current design considerations are uh, for, for municipal odor control and what kind of questions you need to ask. It's very similar to noise. As noise becomes a, 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 a dominant issue, as we just heard in the last presentation, um, it becomes a critical component to the design. Uh, visual mitigation becomes the same, the same type of thing, and it has impacts on what you can and cannot do and the type of technology you may end up selecting, even though that may be your first thought is to, to get the odor control technology right, and then you end up with problems in how I'm going to actually get it onto a site and work with, with neighbors and within a, within a, a community to make it acceptable. And then we're going to talk about what, what are the types of things that we're trying to hide. Um, and I use I use hide in quotes because the purpose of this presentation is to expand out and give you an idea of what what that word can mean. It doesn't have to strictly be be hide. Um, it can be a broader um, a broader concept for you for, uh, from that perspective. Um, and then we'll talk about ways to hide, blend, and integrate uh, with a variety of case studies. That's where we'll spend most of our time here is going through a variety of examples to, to show you how this can be done and how the process can, can work through to get you something that fits what you need uh, site-wise. Um, tr trends in odor control generally um, are tighter restrictions. Um, as, as plants that used to be built out further away from, from property owners now see property coming to them or places that are restricted are having to build new sites where there wasn't um, uh, within communities that are already existing, the, the the requirements become more stringent. Practices that used to be acceptable, like having open basins and, and no treatment and minimal aesthetic integrations, you know, with the the traditional, you know, concrete box for everything on the wastewater plant approach, uh, no, no longer fits, and oftentimes is is will will kill a project just from the visual aspect of it, e even if you have the technical part of it down. Um, and also, there's there's a greater uh, resiliency towards uh, corrosion control and better management of, of your assets. And odor control is is functionally corrosion control. And so, as you manage those those gases within your system, um, you are functioning to to expand the longevity of your your assets. And so, in general, the net result is odor control systems are are becoming larger. They're becoming more prevalent. Um, more advanced and a greater demand for them in order to get a project uh, moving. And so how, how you integrate these things ends up becoming very, uh, very critical. Um, in any design, um, this, this is a table that I have found helpful um, as I've done odor control designs over the years, which is thinking through all the issues that include both the you know the, the technical hard engineering what we typically think of and then the the, the topics that that oftentimes we as engineers uh, tend tend to neglect um, but are, are very very critical for a facility um, when it comes to designing them um, i categorize them in the you know everything from treatment um, um, how, how you pick the technology what works best for you to how you're going to manage air how you're going to move air through the facilities through different basins through different pump stations um, how you're going to deal with noise which is what the last talk was about that that flow chart on how you how you think through that issue um, and it's critical and then impact at the fence line you know dispersion modeling how you deal with with that the key, the key part of this is is the, the the top thing on the list the aesthetics this is the one I, I tend to historically have neglected the most but yet has become um, extremely important when it comes to actually designing out the facilities um, and making them work it oftentimes drives stuff that we think initially is is potentially more important like with the treatment technology right selection of the treatment technology is just that's that's the most critical thing um true but um exactly what you pick you may find is is driven by the aesthetics and noise more so than than um the the treatment technology you you may actually have more variety of options within that category that get whittled down because of these other these other categories so what exactly are we trying to hide? I'm going to go through this quickly um, because uh, Grizz mentioned the technical part of this in the last talk as far as these technologies. But I want to give you a good visual just so you have in, in your head the types of things that you are trying to deal with when you're, when you're saying, how am, I going to, how am I going to make this look as far as aesthetics and visual mitigation of, of a system? Um, chemical scrubbers, as was mentioned, ha are, you know, they're, they're physical chemical systems, very nice, um, can be tailored to a lot of different compounds. So they, they work excellent as far as treatment capacity, but they also require a lot of auxiliary components. You see in the pictures on the right, the geometries can vary heavily from you know, rectangular box style to tower style. Um, you're including fans, you're including ductwork, and in the background of that upper picture in particular, um, you can see that there's the, the, the 
chemical storage tanks as well, which you have to deal with those at the same time. So in the top picture, you can see they chose a canopy approach and they were probably in more of an industrial area where it, it, it was okay for people to see uh, the, the, the equipment and they took, they took the advantage of doing that. You know, visually making the equipment uh, uh, visible outside the plant boundary was, was okay here. And so they went with that approach. But as you, as you tighten it down, it can cause restrictions for your plant maintenance staff as well as, as, as how you approach that. So these are the kinds of things you're trying to hide there. Um, biological treatment can vary. Um, there are two main, two main geometries when it comes to, to visual mitigation that you have to think about how you're going to arrange on a site, which is if, if you're going to pick a bio scrubber trickling filter type design, which is the upper, upper picture, that is going to tend to drive you towards vessels that look a lot like, uh, similar to the chemical scrubbers. You know, they're, they're going to be large FRP type vessels with duct work. Um, oftentimes, you know, a fairly high, um, uh, height to width ratio. And so it's, it's, it's vertical that you're going to have to deal with, but you can also go with more traditional bed biofilter designs like the bottom photo. Those ones have their own mitigation issues, but are, are lower profile. And so if, if you're, if you're dealing with a visual mitigation and you have height restrictions on a site because of property or local ordinances, these are the, this may push you towards one technology or the other and what the advantage can be. Oftentimes the bed biofilters will have larger footprints potentially, um, but at the same time, the, the visual, the, the vertical part of it's taken care of. Carbon scrubbers are, are similar to the other vessels in the sense that um, you're gonna have some sort of FRP vessel, but the geometry can vary heavily. Um, what you see on the right is, is a, you know, a vertical um, a cylinder type design, which is more traditional, but you can also have um, horizontal style vessels look like more like you know, torpedo tubes on the, on laying on their side. Um, you can change how they're designed. You can custom set them up. And one thing to note is that no matter which technology you pick, if you're going to visually mitigate something, this, the, this picture shows what is essentially the absolute minimum, um, which is the, the optimum for, uh, for operation and maintenance, which is to be able to just put it all out on a pad and have lots of room all around it. If you're, in, if you're in the middle of a treatment plant, that, that could be feasible and is most likely the best, best way to go. Um, but if you're at the edge of a plant or if you're on an off-site facility, that could be totally not feasible for both security and, and visual aesthetic reasons. And you have to make sure that whatever you do is going to impact how, how an operator is going to get to this equipment. There are different ports, different locations, different ways that these pieces of equipment, whether it's a chemical scrubber or a biological system or carbon, have to be serviced. And if you visually mitigate it in a way that makes it impossible for a operator to do their job, at, with that particular piece of technology, then it's 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 not going to be of use to you. So, given that, given those pictures in your mind as far as what what we're going to try to be um, hiding here, what I want to do is go through three three options for how to visually mitigate within different architectural standards. And these options, as you move from option one, two to three, I'll have two examples in each category. But as you move from top to bottom here, we're going to move from from one philosophy extreme to the other, um, uh, the, the idea of, of you know complete complete mitigation in the sense of complete hiding of, of structures where there, there can be no known idea that there is anything present, <laughs> um, all the way to taking an odor control piece of equipment and actually integrating it into a visual barrier approach so that the 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 odor control equipment is actually placed in front of the public's eyes on purpose um, in order to make it visible to them. None of these options are necessarily right or wrong. They simply stem out of different criteria and site uses and what you, you can and cannot do in order to make something work. And so they'll, they'll cover the gambit of technologies. All three that I mentioned, for instance, carbon, biological, and chemical all have at least one example within these categories. And they range um, from different areas. They're all examples from the Northwest, um, Washington State in particular, um, but different areas around Puget Sound and Central Washington. So give you an idea of a variety of approaches that can be done here. So we'll, we'll cover everything basically from from how widely varying this can be, but give you an idea of of where these where you can move within these different uh, these different technology components. So option one. Um, the, the examples I'm going to provide are uh, the, the Genesee and Henderson CSO facilities. These are combined sewer overflow facilities that were constructed in Seattle, Washington. They're both very new. Um, the Henderson facility is just, just getting completed now, and, and the Genesee has been online for a few years. Um, uh, Seattle Public Utilities is the owner and operator. And the key criteria here to note is that neither site where these were constructed previously included any extensive wastewater structures. So 
these are quote unquote new facilities. And so, and they're located near and within parks on the waterfront. So you can imagine those two, those two bullets right there, not only did they drive the need for odor control, they made odor control absolutely essential um, from the perspective of community impact, but how you're going to actually install and locate and visually mitigate that odor control was, was dictated by, these, um, by that fact that you are in an area where the public is not used to, to seeing something. So that design approach table that I showed earlier, you know, we, we went through this table for each of these sites. We, we thought through all these issues. And the key thing is the aesthetics at the top. When you get, when you get past it, you know, you, you pick the treatment technology, you look at the noise, you know, we did, there's extensive noise modeling. There was dispersion modeling done uh, for, for sites here, um, looking at all these issues. But when it came down to the aesthetics approach, there was simply a, it had to be completely and utterly hidden. Um, there was no, there was not even an allowance for any above grade component um, on the site at all, including the exhaust stack. Usually with odor control, you like to have some vertical exhaust capability to get the treated air up and above um, potential receptors. We weren't even allowed that on this site. And it was simply an aspect of, of the, 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 the site as a whole and the requirements that were being placed on, on the project in order to make it, make it feasible. So here's an example of the Henderson facility, which is in Seward Park, Seattle. This is before it was built. This is the area where it was constructed. And this is going to be a large below grade combined sewer overflow tank that was going to be buried in this facility. But as you can see, you, you look at where this is at. This is a park that's well established. It's surrounded by lots of nice homes. Um, people are used to using this. And so um, slapping an odor scrubber in the middle of this, even off to the side, is, is uh, was was simply not not going to be acceptable. Um, the site as a whole, just looking at this, this this is the amount of infrastructure that anybody using the site is used to. You know, they're, they're used to being able to access tennis courts and then and, and go around this facility, and maybe seeing an occasional you know grating or manhole that indicates there's there's something you know uh, pipe or storage. Uh, uh, below ground, but otherwise that's it. And the goal of the project was basically to leave this site with pretty much the same level of impact. So you can you can imagine with an with an odor control facility that simply means you're you're going to be moving uh, in a different direction. Now, for the finished structure, um, I'll show you on the on the on the next slide. This is the type of equipment that we ended up installing that had to be hid. And so this is this is a horizontal carbon scrubber. You, you'll note the geometry on it's a little different than the pictures I showed previously. Um, it's, there's the fan component, there's ductwork, grease filters, instrumentation, everything. This was all constructed in a below grade, in a below grade vault facility. Um, so the cost of this project centered around having to bury all of this, but yet still maintain access. So an operator can come down here, get to this equipment. You'll notice that the, the scrubber vessel has vertical components, um, um, carbon access hatches that go up to the surface to get ac to get um, access by hatches and that 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 has an impact on the cost of the vessel because of the uniqueness of the geometry you'll also notice in the center that the the vessel has large flanges on it you appear to see large bolted flanges that, that's about a seven foot diameter scrubber um, as far as the the size of the cylinder and it had to be it had to be constructed and brought in in pieces in order to be to be to be fit in. If this had been an above grade scrubber, the geometry would have been, um, uh, those, those, those would not have needed to be there. It could have been shipped as a single unit. So um, how you specify and build this um, changes because of the way we had to mitigate it. But every single component that had to do with this, including the exhaust, had to, had to be below grade. Silencers, everything for noise mitigation um, to be accessed by it. Um, this is what it looks like just towards the end of construction with the new tennis courts that were built over the, the CSO facilities. The only thing you see that has anything to do with odor control is that small stainless steel pipe that's coming up out of the ground. It's, it's going to be integrated into a, a bench <laughs> type structure that's going to be by the tennis courts, but that's basically just a little bit of a kind of a, um, a, a P-trap up above ground to keep keep water flow from the tank from getting back into the odor control system. But otherwise, that that's it. That's the entire visual footprint that that the odor control um, exhibited on this site because of the constraints um, and because of what was allowed. What was there previously had to go back in and, and there was no allowance for anything above grade. So it can be done, but you just you just have to, to uh, think through those, those issues. Uh, the Genesee site, I'm gonna take you through one of them, is very similar, um, same owner, same restraints, same uh, conditional requirements on this. So it's a similar below grade storage tank. Uh, this particular one was a little over a uh, tenth of a million gallons, but it was right by the, the park, uh, right by walking trails and right by um, um, 
access areas that were accessed by pedestrians with no no really really visible infrastructure there beforehand. Um, so this one had a much smaller vessel that was installed. That that vessel there is only four feet in diameter. It's a very small odor control need for this vessel just to keep it a little bit under negative pressure. So not big, but you can imagine that that vessel, just like the previous one, had all the same components and had to have the same type of below grade vault constructed for it. So the cost ratio was much uh, higher for this, but still required the same level of mitigation. Um, we were able to do that mitigation and, and make it work. Um, as you can see here, this, this is probably one of the more boring before and after pictures that you can see on a project. Uh, the, the after is actually a rendering, but it, it, it's, it's pretty accurate as far as what can be seen. Um, before, it was a, is a parking lot to get access to the water and the trails, and after, it's the exact same thing. <laughs> Um, just with some some hatches in in the in the pavement, and that was the whole intent. It had to look like that before and after. And so everything that's odor control related has to be buried and worked into an underground vault, where the O and M considerations are taken into account on on what's going to be what's going to be feasible for that type of thing. Now the next option two is where we we move up a step here, um, and where we take this from the perspective of okay, I have to hide it completely. Um, my integration, uh, my interaction with the public has to be essentially nil, um, all the way to, okay, the, the interaction is, is lower, but we're going to sites now where there is some existing infrastructure. So there's some expectation by the public that you're going to see something visually. Um, and so we can, we can build on that and use that, but we have to be very careful about how much we use it and, and how we visually integrate the odor control at these sites. Um, these two sites, Murray and North Beach, are both combined, they're, they're CSO facilities. The purpose of the projects was to build CSO combined sewer overflow tanks, but they were done on sites that already had existing pump stations. Um, and those pump stations had a footprint, and that footprint had already been established in the community. So we're, we're, it's a little bit different than the previous ones that were, that were basically CSO tanks only on existing sites that didn't, didn't have that level of infrastructure. These, these sites do have infrastructure, but there's in the same sense, they're located on parks and in waterfronts that are going to put the same types of restrictions on us, just with a little bit different twist. And so we'll go through each one of these and kind of show you how they worked. Uh, once again, the design table, in this aspect, we went through the same process of choosing treatment technologies. These were carbon scrubbers that were selected again for these because they were off-site facilities, and so it was easier to utilize that as opposed to having chemicals or a larger biological system. Um, air management, uh, we went through noise analysis, we went through impacts at fence lines, all these things that were necessary to make this work. Um, aesthetics wise, the architectural approach was, okay, primarily the odor control is going to be below grade, similar, similar to the previous facilities. Um, but landscaping and integrated design above grade was allowed. There was some integration with above grade facilities that was, uh, that was permitted. So this is the North Beach pump station, um, just the, as it previously existed. It's a, primarily a below-grade pump station, but it had its own site. It had its own fenced-in facility with some above-grade equipment. So it's near a park on the left. The water is also on the left. Um, and you can see very nice community uh, around in, in Seattle. And, and, and the, this community is used to seeing this, this component of it. So it wasn't shocking to them to have to to see something there. there. There was a parcel of land that was already dedicated to municipal infrastructure that they were aware of. And so the issue was, how are we going to use this land? In this case, we had, we had some ability to go, to go above grade. Um, this is a view of that same property from the park side. So you can see um, 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 how that's gonna work from that perspective. Um, basically, some, some mechanical equipment is visible, um, but the key thing here is, is roof line. Uh, it's low profile because all these houses are expecting a water view, and so if you, uh, the one thing you, you absolutely can't do here is is impinge on on property views, and so that's that's where your restriction is coming into play as far as from how how you're going to integrate it. So putting a tall scrubber on this site, yeah, it's, it's their site and their property. King County owns this. You could you could drop if if you wanted to drop a 25 foot tall scrubber on this site, you could, and and you'd never get through the design review board <laughs> and the architectural review board in order to get your project done. Um, and so that's that's where the restrictions come into play. So I want to show you a rendering here. The CSO facility was buried. It was a large 300,000 gallon storage uh, pipeline that was buried in the road, so not visible. The above grade portion though was built as a, to provide some mechanical rooms, um, above grade air gap for water supplies, things like this. And the building approach you can see there was it was a very low pro profile building that kind of blends into the into the background along the, the edge of the site. 
The nice thing about this is that where that red arrow comes in, where you see that appear, that's where the odor control is. And it's in, it's a carbon scrubber that's not above grade, but it's also um, partially exposed below grade. And the building itself can house an exhaust stack. So we were able to go up through the building and exhaust at the apex of the sloped roof so that we got some vertical movement to the discharge air, which helps us with the actual odor, odor issues. The trick with North Beach, it got some more flexibility, is that in this case, yes, it's below grade scrubbers and equipment, but you can see the above grade part, we were able to use a graded top instead of a full below grade you know, HVAC controlled equipment room. Um, this allowed the operators to see it from above while they're on site, and they don't have to go down into it unless they needed to. They can get access to the carbon from above, they can get access to the equipment from above, but at the same time, in context of all of that, it's still a little bit more visible. You, you can see it when you're on site, and it's not quite as constrained from an operations perspective. And we get, we're able to take advantage of blending in a discharge stack into an existing building and coming out the roof line. The nice thing about that, too, is the building hides a discharge stack, so you're not worried about getting complaints just because people see a new stack appear on site. And they start thinking they smell odors, um, when in reality, it's more of a psychological issue where they're, they're, they're simply seeing a change in the in the uh, scenery, and that can that that's what's leading to potential complaints. So this allowed us to house everything, but keep something keep something a little bit more open and a little bit more integrated from how we're going to hide it and keep keep the cost down. We didn't have to build as extensive of of a below grade uh, structure, one that was a little bit more open. This is partly towards the end of construction where you can see the building on the left there and the site. The site we were able to get rid of some of those blue uh, fans up on top of the structure. Some of them had to remain. But over where you see the uh, the orange cone area is actually where the graded surface is, where the odor control vessel is. So from a visual impact, it's almost the same as, as the previous um, projects that we looked at, the Genesee and Henderson projects. But it's, it's more open from an operations perspective, and we have some above-grade capability to integrate a stack and, and still hide it, but at the same time, give us some, some better dispersion. So the quality of what we're getting is, is a, little bit, a little bit different. And because we had slightly different design criteria and a site to work with, so the community wasn't, wasn't uh, thrown off by that. Um, for the Murray site, uh, this is, this is an, an interesting one in the sense that the, the, the pump station was there, but it was below grade in a park. And so people were used to seeing a bunch of hatches in a part of the park, but they weren't really seeing anything above grade. Well, this project needed an above grade portion, so the county actually acquired a parcel, several parcels of land um, to build the large CSO tank, and that, that was simply the need for the volume. But they decided to make to actually improve the area through visual, visual integration. So here's, here's what people saw before. The, the pump station was below grade, lots of hatches to access it. But overall, you know, houses right nearby. So the odor control was critical um, because you, you have people literally within you know, 20 feet of your, your pump station. And so that needed to be um, upgraded as well as adding the new CSO facility. Now the approach they took because they needed additional land was to try to blend in something with, with the property. Um, so here's an example of what they looked at with the park down the bottom left and the new the new facility above grade. This was actually going to be a facility where the security was critical um, because you're going to allow the public to walk through the site. They can walk over the roof of the building, down along into the park. Um, and so from this perspective, the odor control is hidden. The main scrubbers are hidden, but they're integrated within a building facility that's going to be um, very, very publicly present. Um, from from just a, from a BIM modeling perspective, you can see here's here's where the uh, the the odor scrubbers were in a below grade portion above the CSO tank. Big scrubbers, a couple of 10 foot diameter units, um, accessed from the top in a large mechanical room. So there was cost to this, but it gave us the ability to integrate um, within a facility that was going to be very publicly present. So lots of stuff to hide down there. So the the, the space itself was fairly expansive. The footprint was big. Um, but at the same time, it was very usable. Um, we got enough space for operators to get in there. They could access it fairly easily from the top. Um, and we got dispersion capabilities because we could integrate a stack on the upper levels. So this, this is an example of what the final process looked like. Um, you can see the area is very nice. People can walk through this facility down to the park. Um, and so because of that, the scrubbers need to be hidden just from a security perspective so people can't, can't tamper with it because they are going to be able to walk through the site. But you can see also um, in the top left photo there, two, the two odor stacks for the, for the two facilities were integrated with the facility so that they, they blend into the facade and are used to get good dispersion, but took advantage of the fact that we had an upgraded facility that was going to have a public presence. So still mostly hidden, but taking advantage of some of those aesthetic capabilities to make use of, of that, that aspect. 
Now the last two are probably the most um, elaborate when it comes to how you're going to actually expand um, a facility in order to really make it front and center. Um, one, one example uh, of this, and this is taking it to the point where, where municipalities that chose to, to have a more overt uh, visible presence to the community um, in order to make what they do known, in order to educate the, the public, and part of that is, is, is allowing them to see some of the stuff that you do on the site and not necessarily thinking you have to hide it, but, but making it visible so people can understand, oh, this, this is what's going on here. Um, but doing it in a way that's arch architecturally reasonable, um, that that blends in and that and that causes people to look at it and say, "Hey, this is this is a, this is a nice thing I'm looking at, um, and not something I want to want to turn my head from." Um, the first example is going to be the the Bud Inlet plant, which is part of the Lot uh, Clean Water Alliance. This is down in the port of Olympia, and it discharges to Bud Inlet. Um, the the this project centered around brand new primary clarifiers that were done in a recent plant expansion and required a great deal of odor control integration and expansion. Part of the reason for that, this is this is an older photo that shows you as we're beginning construction. In the top right there, you can see what looks like very nicely landscaped areas, and that's because um, Lot expanded their their admin building and created a, an educational center for the public that people could come into that highlighted their reclaimed water capabilities. And you can see in the top right of that photo, this was this was from several years ago when they were starting to build a new new infrastructure in the port. It was no longer a port in the sense of it's strictly industrial. They're now getting commercial streets and across the street is being built a, a, a new children's museum that's being constructed. The new clarifiers, unfortunately, because of the siting of the plant, we need to put those literally right on the sidewalk. So, you know, you're, you're building new infrastructure and you're, and you're going to put in new primary clarifiers that are 10 feet away from where people are going to be walking and parking to go to this, this museum. Um, so here's what it ended up looking like. Um, this is a rendering, but it shows the current development where you can see new clarifiers on the building on the left, and then a new chemical facility, uh, chemical and mechanical building um, uh, on the right, that are then being integrated into the whole reclaimed water, children's museum, and educational center in the admin building that Lot had constructed. This creates an entirely different view from this corner of the plant, architecturally speaking, visual mitigation wise, than say if you go to the other corner of the plant that's more traditionally how it was built uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, this is the Hands-On Children's Museum. It's photos, it still shows the construction fence. This has been this has been running for a couple of years now, so you can go down and visit it. Um, the trick here is that you can see this is that that's where we were going to build the clarifiers on the left, and that's where the the uh, the public was going to be on the right. So odor control was a given, and it had to be fairly robust. But at the same time, you didn't want to hinder the ability of the development of this area or this site. So when we looked at different technologies, we ended up going with a fairly robust combination of both chemical scrubbers and carbon. And one thing we decided to do was, because of that technology, we knew we were going to need some space for chemical storage. We decided to use the building itself as a screening feature. So the building was, the chemical facility was built as an L-shaped building, which allowed us to essentially hide the main the main industrial stuff that the stuff you want to keep secure the scrubbers themselves and the fans it also provided noise mitigation because of the high walls around it so the noise tended to go back into the plant as opposed to out to the street um, it also gave the operators easy access because they could walk to it easily from the plant side but from the from the opposite side you didn't need to worry about it and it only required a little bit of visual mitigation walls outside of the main structure it was simply a matter of taking advantage of, of what you knew you already had to build and shaping it in a way that made it useful to for the visual and noise component. So this is what it looks like rendering wise. I'll show you some pictures in a second. The new primary sedimentation and the new chemical building. One thing you can see is as you walk along the street, you have no idea what's behind there, really. But yet at the same time, the visual look is very nice for the for the the blending into the admin and the and the children's facility. The odor control is all hidden behind that chemical building, um, but it's still yet it's still out in the open. So when this this is the construction of what was actually back there, but it was it was totally hidden and yet still fully accessible from the O and M perspective, but the public didn't see it. When the public came around to the front, you know you have fully covered clarifiers, you have covers, you have odor control, all taking place within those buildings, ten feet away from where somebody is walking, but they they don't realize what's going on. Um, what they tend to be able to see is this which is a nice street frontage controlled. And one of the aspects of integrating this is, yes, it was hidden, but at the same time, the street frontage took advantage. We had some large ducts that had to cross between it and the architect took hold of that and said, okay, I'm gonna brace this and support this in a way that makes it look like part of my architecture. So the, the duct was colored, the FRP was colored and was integrated with, with a bracing system that 
It actually made it look like part of the building. So the site's secure, but it looks really nice. And, and you get all the treatment that you want without, with the visual mitigation impact, it lets people know, hey, this is an industrial site, but it's, it's, it's something that's pleasant to look at. Um, and then that's what the waterfront ends up looking like. So um, everybody is, is happy with that. And you get something where you can showcase your treatment plant without um, um, having to worry about the uh, complaints um, or security issues. Um, the last example I'm going to do is, is Wenatchee. This is one of the most interesting ones that I've, I've seen in a while, um, where it's along the Columbia River. They had their wastewater plant. And the city did a project where they made an explicit effort to engage the community for both visual mitigation and odor control. They had a park they needed to deal with. This plant in the bottom right was more the traditional you know, concrete construction, lots of open tanks and clarifiers. So there was an odor issue that needed to be addressed, and they wanted to present a better face to the community along that road at the bottom of the photograph. And the key to doing that was, was combining the two projects. This is actually what it looks like now. And um, the street frontage on the top left, you can see, is vastly different um, what the public sees, and it involved mostly landscaping and, and fencing. The bottom part, you can see a checkered pattern and, and new covers, and those were integrated in a way where that checkered pattern is actually the biofilter. So when you look at this, they chose a biofilter technology to utilize this, but when they integrated it, they actually built it up around a cover system that allowed them to collect air where everything was painted nicely so that it visually worked well with the building, looks clean, looks nice gets the odors contained. But then you build a biofilter, which in that sense is building up rocks. And, and this is an inorganic filter. So it was a rock-based um, uh, biofilter, traditionally built up. But we said, well, if you're going to pay for that, why not do a little something on top to help this out? So when, once you build the biofilter, they move to this. So that biofilter is actually exhausting through all those upper decorative rock beds, um, relatively inexpensive. But as you're walking along that street front, that's what you're seeing. And so they put the odor control right front and center with the public um, and made it something where somebody could actually not only see something that was that was visually enhanced, but it, it didn't hold back any of the any of the quality of the treatment. It simply required a little bit of landscaping on top and a, and a concerted effort to integrate it visually. Um, not a lot of building space either. This is mostly canopies, glass, things like that that are not super expensive compared to say enclosing it all in a building and trying to hide it. This, this plant actually chose to put it front and center. And so when you're walking along the street front, you remember that first photo I showed when, when we, before the plant started, that, that's what you traditionally look at and say, oh, that's the wastewater plant. Well, now they've got much better odor control. So the technical aspect is taken care of. But when somebody walks down the street, this is what they see. They can walk up and, and actually see what's going on. And it actually, it enhances the street. It makes it look better. This is one of the nicest things on the street now. Um, would be instead of um, um, what you would traditionally see. So a very concerted effort to place the odor control right in the public view and say, hey, th this is what we do. We can make it look nice. We can find a way to do this where we meet our treatment goals and, and make it look effective. So in general, summary wise, um, visual mitigations and aesthetics always have to be thought through on a project. You might, you might dismiss them early and be done with them, and that's, that's fine. If you're in the middle of the plant, it may be a very quick exercise, but when you get to some of these other projects, it may be a, a massive driver. Um, the restrictions on you may place this at the forefront of how you're going to actually select the technology. Uh, aesthetics can often be the first, thing that, uh, first component that's going to get you public praise or, or public resistance, um, particularly if you're dealing with height issues, local regulations, or just a community that, that's used to seeing one thing and you're going to change it and, and have them see something else. And that, that's a big deal. Um, so it, at least it comes to be a big deal, a bigger deal than I would have thought when I was focusing just on the technical part of this and, and kind of pushing this off to the side. This, this ends up dominating. Um, there's lots of ways to do it. Um, I just showed you a myriad of ways from completely hiding it to integrating it a little bit to completely integrating it and putting your odor control right in the face of the public, which seems um, counterintuitive but uh, can be done. And there are lots of architects now that are actually embracing this aspect of taking the odor control and the industrial look and doing something very creative with it that doesn't necessarily have to have to deal with it from a, from a big monetary expenditure. So remember, this is, you know, sometimes as engineers, as operators, we think of this as the soft side of the design, but this, this can oftentimes be what, what makes or breaks you when it comes to a, a project acceptance. So there's lots of ways to do it. There's lots of flexibility and, and lots of examples in the Northwest of what you can do to make this look good um, and, and find a way to make it work. So with that, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a very interesting and informative talk. So one question we got is that usually what's the cost percentage 
um, for the visual mitigation in the total odor control project. Um, so the, uh, it, it can range like, depending on what what you're gonna what you're gonna go for. So um, the odor control technology itself can be a big range. Um, uh, for instance, those first few projects I showed, the Hender Henderson Genesee project, the, particularly the Genesee one that had a very small scrubber. The the odor component, you know, the cost of the fan and the scrubber and everything was very small compared to the to the price of the of the CSO tank and bearing it. The big cost there was the fact that you had to add buried footprint, buried vault footprint, um, to uh, actually hide that small scrubber and get it down there. That was simply a requirement of the project. But if you, for the, the footprint required for all that stuff to shore and build that below grade concrete structure, um, I don't know the exact number off the top of my head, but I'm sure it dwarfed the mechanical equipment itself. And so that was one where the cost, the visual mitigation cost was probably higher than the actual odor control technology cost. Um, now, if you, if you go forward to say the lot facility, um, uh, where, where we looked at that one, you know, the, the need for odor control was there. So the visual mitigation was actually very little because we used an existing building to hide, for most of the screening. That building needed to be there anyway. We just simply shaped it and arranged it in a way that worked for client. And we added a little, some, some, a little bit of vertical screening walls and the architect added, added some canopy and, and, and effects in order to take the duct and make it part of his architectural frontage. That was pretty minimal cost compared to the odor control. It was, it was, I mean, the odor control equipment on that project was, was, um, you know, well over a million dollars and the cost of adding those, those small bits of, of components to, to integrate it was, was only a small fraction of that. And so that, that, that could be sort of the, the opposite end of it where, where the mitigation was actually minimal. You just had to kind of use what you had in the, in the, in the most creative way possible. So depending on your constraints, you can make the visual mitigation part relatively low cost percentage, especially if you can use what you already have, or if, if the constraints are very tight, it can, it can be very high. If, if you're left with very few options other than, you know, complete, complete hiding in, in tight spaces, sometimes those are, those are, are trickier and the costs will go up accordingly. Uh, I'm, I'm going to have to pop in here, Jeff. Thanks, but uh, I think we need to move on. Okay, so our third and final presenter is uh, David Kopchinski. Uh, David is a is widely experienced in civil and environmental en ah, yes, civil and environmental engineering. He specialized experience in conducting collection system and wastewater treatment plant odor corrosion control studies and in providing detailed odor corrosion control system design services. His PhD study emphasis was uh, related to odor control and involved the modeling of VOC removal in air biofilters. And just as a plug for David, he also put together and uh, uh, develop the uh, survey that he is going to be talking about. So with that, I will turn it over to David. Thank you, Dick. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm going to be basically going over um, uh, a survey and we'll go here and it's going to be a questionnaire that was posted uh, to the PNC WA group. It was uh, prepared by actually a group of us. It wasn't just me. The Order and Air Quality Committee got together and decided to, to, to inquire with their various groups out there what they're using for odor control. So it was sent out to members in 2015, and we were able to get 45 respondents to come back and, and talk to us about what they're using. Um, in summary, the questionnaire broke it into the questions into what are, uh, are PNCWA members using for odor and corrosion control systems in their wastewater treatment facilities, versus what they're doing in their collection systems. And then what we did is, well, after they answered some questions in those two main categories, we broke it down into some further questions. And you'll see those and we'll present those visually for you. Just before I go into the, the survey results, and I know that um, some of our previous presenters showed some nice pictures, but I just wanna summarize what some of the questions were and what we were asking for. And so, Initially, we asked members what they were doing for fall air treatment methods. And of course, those are including chemical injection. We're actually adding something to the wastewater to control the order. There's also the option of wet chemical scrubbers. There's many configurations of those uh, now out there. There's the single stage, multiple stage, each using a different array of chemicals. 
Uh, then you also have your dry media scrubbers, which now can be using various media. Uh, more commonly, you'll see the carbon only, activated carbon, but now we're starting to see the appearance of dual media systems where they're blending carbon, alumina, or blending a, or basically using separate layered medias in these dry media scrubbers. Uh, another picture you saw today was of a biofilter. Uh, basically, there's the inorganic and organic based types. There's also now the appearance and have been for many years proprietary medias um, being proposed. Uh, then there's the biological approach to odor control, which is more controlled with the packing, which would be the biotrickling filters. Uh, with odor control becoming more sophisticated and with basically population coming closer and closer and being more discerning with their odors, you're starting to see other technologies, especially coming from Europe, appearing here. And also, I think it's being driven by operators and, and maintenance staff looking for other things. They're getting tired of feeding chemical. They're getting tired of changing out medias, maintaining wet chemical scrubbers. So there's always that question of what else is out there. So we also um, had another category, which was, you know, what other things are going on? So ozone is making an appearance. Um, there's some headspace fogging applications where they're applying it into the headspace, uh, what's odorous. They're also extracting fall air and they're contacting with ozone and then they're destroying it. Um, some larger manufacturers like uh, are the peroxide match manufacturers are proposing or employing headspace fogging with a dilute peroxide caustic mix. And finally, we're also now seeing um, installations of low voltage corona discharge applications in plant headspaces where plant operators are constantly in. For example, solids handling buildings where the operators, uh, yes, we do care about you. We don't like you sitting in an odorous area all day long. And uh, there's some answers now for that. And again, with all these fall air treatment methods, the, another goal and a key goal is corrosion control. So not only are we controlling odors potentially, we're also doing these things above because we're trying to maintain concrete surfaces and other things, whether it's in the plant or in the sewer. So breaking down chemicals and additives, uh, wet chemical scrubbers primary use is where you'll see the sodium hypochlorite uh, acids and sodium hydroxide. At one time there was sodium hydroxide uh, dosing within sewers, but in our survey today, you'll see that most of the uses of these chemicals are associated with the wet chemical scrubbers. Uh, more uh, applicable to sewer addition is nitrate solutions. Uh, one of the things that we are seeing coming out now are combination solutions where some of the manufacturers are attempting to combine nitrate and the iron salt together or some other compound. Uh, also, uh, another chemical, or in this case, uh, an additive is oxygen. Forced main injection of oxygen is, is appearing in our, in our region and it has been, has been uh, you know, practiced. Uh, also has hydrogen peroxide, iron salts, potassium, potassium permanganate, uh, not so much magnesium hydroxide. You'll see that more used in the Southwest to basically adjust pH and keep the sulfite from coming out of solution. And also now the appearance of bacteria or enzymes. Major nitrate uh, solution manufacturers are now trying to combine an enzyme or other things to help in the process of controlling odors and corrosion. And finally, you'll see the appearance now also of other chemicals or compounds that are attempting to either reduce the activity of the biofilm in the sewer. You'll see the appearance now of a compound called, well, a chemical being used free nitrous acid. So let's get to the results. So one of the first questions was, is we asked our PNCW members, what are the fall air technologies that you use at your plant or your water reclamation facility? As you can see here, going from left to right, there are all the topics we actually asked for. We said, do you have dry media scrubbers? Do you have chemical scrubbers? Do you have bio filters, bio trickling filter? Are you using chemical ejection there? And then we had some other categories to cover UV, photoionization, or other. So you'll see that there is actually, interesting enough, uh, an application where they are using UV or photoionization uh, here in the Northwest. Uh, of course, bio filters are very popular. Over 26 of respondents indicated that they're using some type of bowel filter. And then I'll just speak to the other before I leave this side. What I saw in the, in the survey that others are using or what, they, what we considered another other category was ozone. Um, they are using uh, predominantly some ozone fogging applications at their wastewater treatment plant. So if there's a question as to what other can contain, 
that's what we're picking up is some of the respondents are saying they, they're using ozone fogging. So then what we did is once we got those initial responses on what they're doing for things in the plant, then we asked them, well, if you're, if, if you're using, you know, what chemicals in particular are you using for plant odor control, um, whether it's chemical scrubbers or chemical injection? And the predominant combination we're seeing is most respondents are using sodium hypochlorite, quite a few are using sodium hydroxide. Again, I'll go left to right um, as to what the, you know, what we asked for. So it was sodium hypochlorite, sodium hydroxide, calcium nitrate or other nitrate solutions. We asked if they were maybe using oxygen, hydrogen peroxide, iron salts, potassium permanganate, magnesium hydroxide, bacteria or enzyme or other. As you can see, we really only got responses for sodium hypochlorite, sodium hydroxide, which I suspect are used for their scrubbers. There is some feed of, of calcium nitrate or other nitrate solutions, some oxygen feed for one respondent, and then some use of iron salts. Going further into the results, we then ask some more specific questions like, for example, hey, if you are a dry media scrubber user, what are you using for the material in your dry scrubber? Uh, the, majority, major, the majority of respondents were using virgin activated carbon. There are some respondents, about four of them, that are using impregnated carbon. Uh, only one that was actually specifically indicated that they're using a specialty high capacity carbon that is, is designated as absorbing much more hydrogen sulfide than standard carbons. We didn't see much use of aluminum-based media or even some more newer media coming out, iron sponge type material. However, there was other medias mentioned. Um, that other one I went into the survey in detail was it was a respondent saying they had some sort of carbon media, but they did not know where to place it. So they, they needed to check, but they just indicated that it was some specialty carbon media. Moving on through the results, we also asked if you're using a bowel filter in your treatment plant, what type of media are you using in it? So the majority of the users that are using bowel filters, the one responded to our survey, many of them are using the organic media, which is the wood chips, compost, bark, et cetera. Uh, fewer number are using the organic media, which consists of the soil, sand and the rock. And one other respondent indicated that it was kind of a custom, it was something between organic and inorganic media. So they, they designated it as an other, or we designated it as an other. Then we kind of switched over and then we, uh, Asked the general question of, well, what fall air treatment technologies are you using within your conveyance system? So that would be your sewers and your pump stations. And it was quite a mix. Uh, there's some dry media scrubber usage, some chemical media scrubber usage, um, bowel filters, bowel trickling filters were employed. Quite a bit are using chemical injection. There was no cases of uh, the specialty odor control of photonization being used. And there was quite a bit of other listed almost seven respondents used other. What I can tell you there is that some of the respondents are using ozone odor control uh, locally here in the Northwest. They are basically withdrawing fall air either at a pretty, pretty much at their pump stations and they're basically uh, dosing the ozone. The ozone is not generally added into the headspace. It's withdrawn first, contacted with ozone, and then it's basically destroy it after the treatment process is complete. So that's some of the applications under other. The other uh, respondents are basically using oxygen. So that's where the other is capturing oxygen injection in force mains and uh, is, is under other. So again, uh, drilling down into that conveyance question, we asked then if you are using chemicals, um, what are you using the chemical, you know, what type of chemicals are you using in the collection system? So there is, again, if it's a chemical scrubber, I suspect some of the respondents are, are responding that they're using sodium hypochlorite, sodium hydroxide. Um, others, quite a, quite a few of our, our PNCW members uh, on the collection side are using calcium nitrate or other solutions. Um, there is where the oxygen came out, where we were able to specifically identify that they're using oxygen and the hydrogen peroxide, none, none of the respondents indicated they were using that. Iron salts, potassium permanganate, magnesium hydroxide, bacteria and enzyme were not indicated being used by our, our survey respondents. Again, there was a couple um, responding to other and that's where we're picking up the ozone injection. 
Moving on, uh, we basically then drilled into another question as to what are our members using in their dry media scrubbers out in the collection system. Again, the majority of the respondents that do employ dry media scrubbers uh, out in the collection system are using virgin activated carbon. Over nine respondents indicated that. Quite a few are using impregnated carbon and only a few are using the high capacity material. Uh, also, we did not see a lot of use of other medias um, or mixed media use. So aluminum based media, iron sponge, or other materials were not indicated in or captured in this survey. Then drilling into the question of bow filters, we wanted to see out in the conveyance system what the respondents that did answer, what are they using? The majority again that responded are using the organic media configuration. There was a handful that responded that they do use the inorganic media application in their conveyance systems. So that wraps up just the summary of our survey. We um, you know, I'll leave it to Jeff, our chairman, to see you know what is available or what we can release regarding the survey. There is a spreadsheet. Uh, one of the things that we did um, allow was anonym, anonymous answers. So there's some people that did indicate in the survey that yes, you know, list our names and numbers and share our information. And there's others. The way the spreadsheet set up is that it says there's uh, the person wishes to remain anonymous. So. That's just the background on the survey, and now I will open it up to the group for questions. Thank you for your attention this morning. Thank you, David. Um, here is a question. So the ozone-based technology is mentioned in the survey. How does the ozone work to inactivate sulfide-based odor? such as hydrogen sulfide, mercaptan, or dimethyl sulfide? What we're seeing, and, and this has been a, a, a point of interest, is there's not a lot of literature available to trying to understand what is ozone doing to these odorous compounds. We know that the, the operation staffs that are using it are, are appear to be pleased with it, but as an engineer, you always ask, well, what is it being changed to? So what ozone essentially does to sulfur compounds is it oxidizes it. In so many instances, hydrogen sulfide will be oxidized to sulfate, um, and, some, and some of the odorous compounds will just basically be, be modified. That doesn't necessarily mean that the airstream isn't completely odor-free. What we do find is, is that it significantly changes the odor threshold, making it harder for the airstream to um, basically be detected by the public. And also, too, we're now seeing that many of the ozone providers are providing ozone destruct units. So if there's complete complaints about the smell of ozone, the ozone uh, destruct unit renders the ozone uh, inert. Uh, why, are, you know, why do I see some utilities now employing this system? Well, because they're, they're, they're having uh, sites that are very close to particular residences or other places that are picking up what we term non-hydrogen sulfide odors. So the question that you posted there, Mau Mau, included some other compounds that we're now encountering, which are dimethyl sulfide and mercaptans that our other technologies don't necessarily caption, capture, but our, our nearby uh, uh, odor you know, respondents or receptors are picking up. And so this is kind of the answer um, that some utilities have been trying to apply to reduce those orders. And ozone certainly does a good effect and attacks uh, indiscriminately hydrogen sulfide, dimethyl sulfide, and mercaptans. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. The other question is, what was the response rate of the survey? We did get, um, and I'll have maybe Jeff help me. I know that we had 45 respondents and I don't know, maybe Mike, Michael or, or Jeff can say what was our overall database of, of people that we were able to send the, the, the questionnaire to. Any, any idea, guys? But I, I know that we had 45 respondents and um, a good portion of them were, were municipalities, uh, city municipalities. There was some what appeared to be contract operation groups that were running um, uh, facilities, but that was predominant respondents uh, that were in that list. But I, I believe we just basically had a, a blanket list of whoever um, was our contacts. But Jeff, anything to add to that? 
as to you know what database we might have used to send out the survey. Yeah, th this is Mike. Uh, there, there are uh, not quite fifteen hundred members of PNCWA, and and the survey was prefaced uh, with uh, <clears throat> if if you work with somebody who would be the right person to send this uh, survey to, please do that. So uh, of the people who did respond, uh, it's not exactly a straight uh, response rate um, uh, because a, a lot of our members, of course, would not you know, know uh, the answers to these questions, but we asked them to uh, send the survey on to the uh, the people that they work with in a facility, et cetera, who could answer it accurately. And, and this, this is Jeff. Um, part of the um, w one of the interesting aspects you, you mentioned too that that um, we offered people a chance to provide their contact information, um, which they could volunteer. And part of that is we, we would like for for PNCWA to to morph this this type of of survey into something where there there is the ability for people um, within within PNCWA to contact other folks and have access if you're thinking of using a odor control technology that maybe you are not familiar with. Um, if, if you're used to using X and you have a project or something where you're going to try Y, um, you, there are other people who have done that, um, very likely within PNCWA, and this helps us get an idea of, of you know, what, um, if, if people are willing to share that information, then we can, we can provide that in, in a way where, where you can find somebody, um, other operators, other plants who have, who have, who have used that system so that you can ask, you can, you can talk to them directly. Um, and ask them questions. So if, if, if you don't want to be the first one to try out a technology in, in our area, you can find out who else has done it and see what they think about it. So not to overstep, Jeff, that's what, you know, I wanted, this is a good question posed by the membership. Um, do you think it would be okay for us to, I know there's a, a spreadsheet that I've been working from and it keeps, you know, the people who've answered anonymous and it, but it still shows their answers, but you just don't know who answered it versus the ones that do list their names and the technologies that they're associated with um, as we ask the questions. Um, do you think, Jeff, that's in, that's something that we would release at some point if, if the membership is interested or we post to our website uh, section? Yeah, I think so. I think that that'll be through our through our web our web page, and and the the odor and air quality committee will will have that available, like like presentations, past webinars, things like that. It'll be uh, I foresee it being a resource, um, a, a piece of information that people can get access to um, on our page if they want to look at that, and it'll show what people have allowed us to to show, and if it, if people want to have remained anonymous, they'll stay that way. And if, if people are willing to, to share contact information, you can, you'll can you be able to easily get that list and then take a look at it. So I think we just have to, okay. to decide the format, but that, that's where I'd see. I think it's gonna be something you'll be able to get to um, via our, our committee page, so. All right, and we got another technical question. Um, so the, the photoionization and the corona discharge odor control technologies were mentioned in the survey. How do these they work to control the odor and what are the differences between them? Okay, um, basically what the, the two technologies are is that they're, they're coming from Europe. Um, they're actually quite, you know, used, used there uh, in treatment plants uh, full scale and large size ranging from 1,000 to 10,000 CFM. Photoionization is basically coupling uh, UV light with a catalyst inside a reactor that basically converts the odorous compounds or essentially, you know, catalytically oxidizes them into um, other compounds. I've, you know, I'm going to let uh, Jeff chime in as well. Again, this is a type of technology where we always ask, well, what is it converting the chemical compounds to? So, Photoionization is actually a direct, you know, um, application where it's replacing a wet scrubber or a dry media unit and pulling fall air from a process uh, at the treatment plant. We're also, what we're seeing is the difference between, or the subtle difference between corona discharge and photoionization is corona discharge uses what appears to be a low voltage um, electricity to generate what we call activated oxygen. Like if you're a hiker and you go up to the mountain, you smell that fresh air type um, 
sensation. Well, what this device is doing is it's targeting areas where it's already odorous and that there's operators in and that there's been an issue that people don't want to work in there, whether it's a solid tiling building or headworks and they're there constantly. So these te this technology has been brought into play where it's basically bringing fresh air, they're activating the oxygen into it to radicals and then they blend that in and they recirculate it through the um, area that's odorous in the plant, whether it's a headspace uh, around the solids handling equipment, et cetera. But its key is that both technologies are not attempting, I believe the corona discharge specifically does not attempt to create ozone. It is, it, it's not there, it's, it's there for basically other staff to coexist with it and then also help reduce odors in their working environment. So that in, in, a, in a basic introduction is that, but I know others in my group have worked potentially with these materials and I'd like to have them share their thoughts about either technology. I, I can Thank say- you, David. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, this this is Jeff. I could say on the on the photoionization, I, I know part of it is is as they're they're breaking down the compound, there usually is a a, ca a small bit of a of a catalytic carbon after the the photoionization that tends to catch it, it because of the oxidized radicals that they create in the in the stream. It tends to um, uh, be regenerated, but it will they'll get elemental compounds. I think elemental sulfur and things like that that'll end up getting created. And so the, the, the replacement on that filter ends up being based not on, not on absorption, but it gets plugged um, from, from some of those compounds that end up coming out of the foul air stream. So that's um, one, one of the examples of, of maybe what, what the secondary components are when they start to actually go through that process. All right, great, thank you. Looks uh, like uh, we don't. Uh, this is Dick. I, I noticed another uh, came in on a chat. Uh, uh, why do you think uh, bioxide is so popular for the uh, collection system? And I probably will uh, pile on on that one and ask. Uh, I mean, g given the concern about uh, nitrogen, um, do you have any thoughts in terms of the impact on uh, using bioxide on downstream nitrogen removal? Yes, and I think some, you know, some of the PNCW users that we're encountering are, you know, asking that same question is, is, is what else is out there? And, and that's why you'll see some of the respondents are switching. We see some entities are going to the approach that if we corrosion protect our system, basically put in corrosion resistant materials, and we are, we are looking at, um, you know, trying to reduce our need for chemicals for corrosion control in the collection system, we will just then extract fall air or do other things. That's one of the approaches. And so there's also other chemicals appearing. Uh, I didn't dig into it, but what we're seeing some of the major chemical manufacturers doing now is they're looking at enzymes, or in this case, they're, they're looking through research groups and they're coming across compounds that inhibit hydrogen sulfide formation or the biofilm that accumulates in force mains or in sewers to stop that uh, odor generating activity. So you'll you'll see a compound called nitrous um, acid being now proposed as a chemical additive or replacement to chemical additive. Um, maybe we could focus on that in a future presentation, but I think it's because you know nitrate has been a common chemical because there's a lot of uh, companies out there that are available to to provide it. There are certainly different varieties of it, um, but I do see personally a lot of the utilities coming to us and asking us what else is out there. That's my point of view. Uh, Dick and others, um, excellent question to respond to. Well, I, I would comment that nitrous acid is just another form of nitrogen, so uh, probably need to look at some other things. As I recall, it was what hydroquinone that was used for inhibiting the sulfide generation in the uh, force mains. Yes, and we see like someone like an Avoqua they, and others are, are looking at something like that, that they're combining with their uh, nitrogen salts. So you'll see um, bioxide AQ uh, and some derivatives of it. Um, uh, oxygen, you'll see oxygen injection uh, now being more seriously looked at. Uh, I'm certainly sure Grizz and, and, and Jeff know of some of their applications where there is some full-scale oxygen injection uh, projects that may be going in uh, locally. Uh, to address force main uh, order control and corrosion.
I don't yeah. see any uh, specific question coming up for the survey. Maybe we can open up for the general questions for all the presentations. Yeah, I, I would just, you know, add on to the issue of oxygen in, injection. Once upon a time, we just uh, injected oxygen into the force main. I think there's some new technology out there that uh, basically pulls flow off, uh, hyperoxygenates uh, that that flow, and then injects it into the uh, back into the uh, flow to uh, mainly to avoid any kind of off-gassing that could uh, lead to downstream problems. Any comments? That's that's correct, Dick. That's that's really the approach now is, and then also you know the technology is developing and how they saturate the oxygen. There's different saturation columns. Uh, particular manufacturers, you know, have specialty saturation uh, columns that they use as they withdraw it. Um, it's also you have to be very concerned about what the pressure uh, of your force main is. Obviously, with higher pressures, you're going to have much more success. Um, but um, I am aware, you know, uh, that King County is looking at it for their Sunset Heat Field uh, pump stations, and um, it's it's starting to appear. But like Dick, you point out, there are concerns about air binding and then how effective and, and what it takes to maintain the equipment that's associated with it, because you need to generate the oxygen, and usually you're do, doing that with a oxygen generator um, piece of equipment. Yeah, once upon a time, we had a big, uh, oops, I'm going to say once upon a time, we just had a, a liquid oxygen tank at the uh, uh, a force main and, and uh, vaporized the oxygen and injected it uh, directly. But uh, yeah, I think some of the smaller systems are, are doing their on-site oxygen generation just to, to make it simpler. Looks like there's one more question coming up. Does the biology of a typical shredded wood open biofilter tolerate reduced or intermittent airflow, such as shutting down the blower at night or even shut down seasonally? So that question, I guess, you know, David, Grizz, or Jeff, feel free to provide answers. Okay. Well, I guess I'll lead off. This is David. Um, you know, biofilters are their biological system. So, it, you know, depending on the extent of the shutdown, if it's an annual shutdown, you have to be very careful that you're leaving that biofilm or the, the biology that's within that filter uh, not being fed anything. So you would expect that you'd have to do some sort of preparation, uh, whether reseeding the media or just knowing that it's going to take a little bit of time after an annual shutdown that it will take some time for the biomass to rebuild and, and reestablish itself. Um, if you're just looking like for periodic shutdowns from uh, from just basically shutting down overnight, yeah, I, I think that might not be much of an activity, but I'm going to pass that uh, on to maybe Jeff or Grizz as to whether they have any um, response or direct experience because, yeah, I've not really thought about uh, periodic, you know, nighttime shutdowns. Well, let, let me pop in on that one because uh, number one, uh, usually you're, you're evacuating air from some kind of a space and there's two issues. If it's an occupied space, uh, you need to continue the air evacuation anyhow to meet uh, uh, OSHA standards. And if it's a uh, covered area, unless it's extremely well protected against corrosion, what you're allowing uh, to happen is the uh, sulfide especially to build up and probably increasing the potential of uh, corrosion in the uh, covered areas. So it seems like um, most likely it would not make a lot of sense. It's kind of uh, penny wise pound foolish. I would I would think this is uh, this is Jeff. In, you know, s some degree of intermittent operation might be okay as long as you maintain moisture on a on a on a wood chip type biofilter. Um, part of the airflow through there sometimes is humidification as well. So if you can if you can keep it stable for short short periods, and it it's like any other biological system, the steadier you can feed it, the bit the more consistent it's going to be. 
Um, but, you know, I would think, a, you know, a few hours would not be a problem, particularly if you had maybe a secondary irrigation system to make sure it stayed it stayed wet. It's, it's when you start going for days that you're going to get um, an inconsistent biomass or inconsistent feeding that um, uh, you may or may not see a problem. It would probably be something you need to you need to experiment on how how often you could you could turn it off for how many hours, turn it on, and essentially maybe slug load it with something that had built up and and the biomass was still strong enough to maintain it. So an annual shutdown, yeah, you're going to be restarting it um, for for a handful of hours. Um, it, it might be feasible, particularly if you can you can you know ma maintain the bed uh, moisture and pH levels. Yeah, this is Grizz. I know we've never really experimented with biological systems and, you know, intermittent shutdown. I know for like wet scrubbers, uh, you know, there's been some testing of reducing the chemical usage during the nighttime. Uh, and so there's been, you know, some testing uh, in that event. Yeah, this is Dick again. I, I would just, you know, again, throw out that uh, uh, it kind of depends on what the purpose of the bio filter is. And if it's evacuating uh, occupied areas, especially, then um, you need to keep in mind that uh, you can't necessarily shut it off. Yeah, thank you for all the responses. Actually, uh, I have a one question for Adam regarding the noise modeling. So does, does the, mo the no noise modeling consider the frequency or specific time of the day, time of the week of the noise generation? Yeah, that's, really, that's a really good question. So most, um, most if we're going by compliance with the local regulatory criteria, whether it's a city code, county code, or state code, most of them do not consider um, sound pressure levels at specific frequencies. So it's the overall broadband A-weighted sound level is typically what the codes will reference. There are some exceptions, namely the, the state of Oregon and the city of Portland. They um, actually limit sound pressure levels in octave band frequencies. So you end up with sound pressure level limits between you know, 63 or 31 and a half hertz all the way up to eight kilohertz. The modeling itself does account for uh, at least the approach that we use. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The The software that, that we've used does account for uh, sound emissions at various frequencies. So it looks at those octave band sound levels so that we can account for insertion loss from various sound traps, for example. Uh, silencers and odor control systems. We can look at the insertion loss at 63 hertz, 125 hertz, 4 kilohertz. And also the sound emission from the very, from like the odor control fan is different at different frequencies. So the modeling definitely accounts for that and it combines the total footprint. But in terms of actually complying, determining compliance, it's typically just that overall A-weighted sound level. Okay, well, this, this is Dick. It, it looks like, you know, we're, we're coming up on 11 o'clock. Um, really like to thank everybody for um, tuning in. Um, please uh, be aware that you will be getting an email uh, later on uh, with the information you need to uh, sign up for CEUs. And uh, I guess with that, I'll turn it over to Michael to finish things off.